Yes. All right, so I did want to let you guys know that um, on this chapter, I I am going to be skimming, excuse me, over some of the examples, because some of the examples, to me at least, were more about stats than they were about function factories. And I was trying to really, so I, I may have gone a little rogue on this. <laughs> we'll see. I tried to organize things a little bit differently because for me, I was thinking about why do I want to use function factories? And so I was trying to put every kind of example into that context of why I want to use this. And the irony is I've definitely used them before. I didn't know they had a name, but um, I kind of just on my own needed to solve a problem and figured that out that way. So I might go through and talk about that too, depending on like kind of the timing of things. Anyway, I, in, the, in the end, I actually found this chapter reasonably short because most of it's examples. And the ideas of the function factories themselves, I think is pretty simple. I think where it gets tricky is what do we do with them? Um, what are the appropriate uses of them? So uh, learning objectives for today, we want to understand what a function factory is, recognize how they work, learn about these sort of non-obvious combinations of function features um, and how you might generate like families of functions from data and things like that. Um, and probably I should have put one more learning objective is understand when you would use one. Um, I left these in. I don't think I'm actually using some of them, but um, some of the examples might use them. I did modify quite heavily the previous person's um, use of this. Uh, so first off, we want to talk about what a function factory is. It, it is in a nutshell, just a function that returns functions. So they are sort of manufactured functions. Although it is important to remember that they're not really any different from any other function you might create. You're just using a function to create them in the first place. So they work by essentially, uh, so as an example that we were using, and I'll use a lot here, we were using this sort of power one function. We, I think we're calling it power one because there is a power function in R and we're trying not to overwrite the, get um, into a, a conflict there. Um, this function takes exponent or exp as, a, um, as, a, as an argument and it returns a function that puts X to the exponent. And then you can use it by, for example, saying, well, we want to create a square function. And so now if we assign square to power one with the argument of two, we get a square function. If we do with the power of three, we get a cube function. And these are then functions that we can then use in, um, in sort of future uh, code. So the things to remember that I was thinking about when it comes to this is that this only works um, because we have sort of, or this only works and only works the way it does because of three kind of important things. And I had to kind of go back and remind myself because they kept talking about, oh, R has first class functions and I have no idea what a first class function is, even though I know we covered it. So a first class function is that essentially these objects, the R, these functions are objects. We don't create them using special syntax. Um, we create them using another function, which is the function function. I was trying to explain this to my spouse the other day, and he looked at me. He's like, you're saying the function uses the function to create the function, which creates a function? I was like, yeah, something like that. <laughs> anyway, that means they're first class functions. So essentially, we are using the assignment operator um, to create them. And that is essentially why we can have function factories, because they are, there's nothing really that all that special we need to do to make them. The second thing that's important, or the second two things, I should say, are the idea of environments. Um, functions are going to capture or enclose the environment in which they're created. And that was kind of like, I don't think I really thought about that too until we got into the examples of the iteration functions. And that like kind of blew my mind that you could have this little environment that existed and could be modified. Anyway, that was crazy to me. So the environment in which a function is created is kind of encapsulated um, enclosed by the function uh, as it's created. And the other part that we, I think most of us are relatively familiar with is this idea of a fresh start, is that the functions are gonna create a new environment on each run, each time they run. <clears throat> Internal or what do we call it? A running environment, something like that. All right, so um, I wanted to go over some of the fundamentals as I talked about in the chapter. Um, so the environment, to me, this is pretty much what I just said, I think, for point number two, but it was kind of like an important one to me that I didn't quite capture until I went through this chapter, is that the environment, when the function is created, 
defines the function, the arguments in that function. So how we, like what arguments we have in that environment can be important. Um, and we can use, if we're trying to troubleshoot or figure out what's going on in our own code, we can use the env print and the fn env functions to explore that. So for example, env print on that square function we created will tell us what the environment was, um, what the parent environment was, and what the bindings are. And once you know what the bindings are, you can then use the function environment to pull out those bindings to explore. So in this case, we can say that, yeah, the exponent for square is two. Um, I also put this figure in here to kind of just remind us um, that when we are looking at these figures, because again, I had to remind myself, uh, we've got, this is our function. These uh, blocks with a, um, a round bit are the function. This is the name that is bound to that function. We kind of think of, I think of it as being like a, a pyramid in my head and the arrows kind of go down the pyramid. So we think about, we got a square, that's a name. That name is bound to this function. Um, that function has an environment that is this one here. And we know it's an environment, it's got a little blue. I think the dots always indicate the environment here. The blue means it has a parent. And it's got a variable or uh, exponent or exp that is currently bound to two. And the cube is the same, except for that um, a variable is bound to three. And it's a separate environment. That's important is that although these were created with the same function, they have their own separate um, enclosed environments. Debbie, is binding like names? Yeah. That's the naming we covered right at the very beginning. It's the, the, my, because I covered that chapter, I feel like I've got a little bit of a handle on that one. Um, yeah, so when a name is bound to an object, essentially, or a, a square is a name that is bound to the function. And so right, that right, that's not, that's not what I meant. I meant um, in, in the output of env print, it says bindings. Yes. Which isn't um, quite the same as the binding of the very yeah. Related, related, but. I, I mean, I'm going to make an educated guess and just say that it's kind of like the idea that you, you have a named, a named, are you have a named object inside that art environment that you can reference. Right. So you have something that has a binding because if it doesn't have a binding, you can't reference it. You right. can't. So that's kind of how I think of it as being like, these are things that are bound to names so we can actually deal with them. Right. Because um, we do the dollar sign X. Yeah. Good. Um, forcing. This was another one that like kind of blew my mind when I saw this and I was just like, are you kidding me? That is not okay. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you could probably do some really clever and really dangerous things with this idea. Um, the idea comes from lazy evaluation and there, it only applies in a very specific situation. It, um, essentially means, and we learned about this a little bit in our functions chapter two, about when arguments are evaluated, is X is not evaluated here until it is used. And so we can call X2, we can create a new square function using our power one function. But then if we call X3 and then we use the square function, it actually, be, that power for that square function becomes three because it's not actually evaluating X until we've used that function once. So I, I like the quote of like, that can lead to a real head scratch of a bug. Like I could see that driving me like absolutely up the wall because it would be so nightmarish. Um, I also realized two things to me is that this only applies if you're passing the object as an argument. And that may be obvious here, but like you're not gonna have this problem in this case here, even though the argument, um, well actually no, the argument's called X here, but even if the argument was called X, um, it wouldn't matter in this scenario here. So it only matters if you're doing this because this is being lazily evaluated. And the other thing is that it only matters, um, right, sorry, the next thing I was gonna say, you can use force, um, to overcome this. And another thing that I was thinking to me, because I got really confused later on, because I realized that they weren't using force for every input variable. And I was like, wait a minute, you have to use force everywhere. And they weren't. So I was like, why are you not? Um, and then I realized it doesn't actually matter if the argument is evaluated before you create that function. So if we had updated our power one function and we didn't use force, but we essentially used um, stop if not, for example, that stop if not is 
like a check that a lot of people put into a function that makes sure that your arguments have the right, um, like they're the right type. So you make sure the exponent has to be a numeric, for example. So you say stop if not is numeric x, but you're evaluating x right here. So you don't actually have to force it. Force it is only necessary if you are not going to use that argument before you create the function. So there's two things. It only matters if it's being Sorry. as an object, right? Yeah. Um, in the in the code that you have right there, the first Archon, what if one? Sorry. no no this one? Um no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too fast. Stay here, stay here. <laughs> okay. In this first R chunk, um, if you hadn't um assigned x to two, like if x just wasn't an object, if you did remove x or whatever, and then you tried to do square gets power one x, would it give you an error? I don't think it would because it's not actually, but let's check. Um so if we just went. Oh, sorry, I got to create the power function. Let me grab that. And you have to make sure you don't have an X in your um, environment somewhere. Uh, that's a good call. Yes, in my environment, simply. All right. Yeah, no problem. Um, now, if I try to run square, I'll get an error because object X not found, which would be also a really crazy error to get. Um, when, as for a user, if you weren't the person who created that. Wait, why, why isn't it found when you run it square two? Doesn't it stick to? Because two there? is not, because in the power function oh, right, 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 here. Right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, got it. Um, it, it's, it, I shouldn't have used X actually. What I should use is Y <laughs> and that will make more sense. I think then. Um, if we say, no, I got it, I, I get it. I get yeah. It. I'm doing actually, I think more for myself at this point, because now I'm kind of, I'm confused myself, but. So if we say we've got nothing here. Oh, right. And now I want to try square three object. Why not found? Okay, good. Sorry, that's, I just wanted to verify for myself that that made sense. And now if we add Y in, all of a sudden it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, so these were things that were kind of like a little bit of a hiccup for me. And so if, if you were kind of like, well, that was obvious to me, then sorry. But um, yeah, so for me, it was clear that I needed to, this only really mattered if we are using the argument called as an object first. And if we don't actually use it before we actually create the function. So this was um, another kind of interesting thing for me was this idea that we could modify the environment that the function is bound to. And um, I think there's sort of two things that come out of that that are kind of important. One is that we can modify the environment and that can be a useful tool. So you can kind of, you know, this idea of using the super assignment to modify the external function. So for example, in this case, we're creating a function that's going to modify this external environment here that is then bound to that function means that you can create these like counters, for example. Um, and the other thing we'll talk about is then that you have to then carry that environment around. Just, it doesn't just disappear. So it, you know, if it's a really big environment, you've got a lot of space in there. Um, I've always been afraid of the super uh, assignment. I've always thought that that was like a terrible idea to like start messing around with like the parent environments. Um, so when I see this, I immediately go like, no, you can't do that. Um, but in this case, I think it's really cool because it really is still a very contained idea that you are only modifying one environment up. But they were clear that as soon as you start to get like, a little bit more complicated than this, you probably want to switch to R6, which I think I'm going to miss the week on that one. Maybe we'll see, but um, that'll be a kind of cool one to kind of cover. I'm not, mon I'm not monitoring the chat. So if anyone has any questions that we should cover there, are we good to go? I was just saying like, I also misunderstood the super assignment for a long time as just right into global, which yeah. was incorrect. And uh I mean, let's clarify it and now I can see where I'm definitely more useful. 
<laughs> yeah, I, that's exactly how I always thought of it. And I was just like, no, your functions should not write to global because that is mean to your user. If you're thinking about writing functions for your users. Um, but yeah, it's cool. So the other thing, because of this environment that is being attached to the function that we need to, um, because the environment is, I think of it as being attached and it's like being carried around with it. Um, but the official term is enclosed. So because this function is enclosing this environment, um, the temporary um, objects don't go away. So you do need to remember to use RM or remove inside these functions um, to kind of clear things up. So for example, in this here, if we are creating a large object in our dirty function here, um, it's it's uh, you know eight megabytes that we're carrying around with us that we don't need to because that object isn't necessary for the function anymore. Um, but if we clean it up in our clean function here, um, then it's much smaller. So that's a good memory saving tip. Yeah, I can feel... I go back to the um to the previous page? Sorry, with the no parent environment. Um so so uh, I was I didn't spend as much time with this chapter as I no should have this week. So apologies, I'm just trying to catch up. And um I feel like what the you guys just said and what you said in the in the chat or what people were saying in the chat is that this double um super assignment, people thought it meant go to the global but in this case it wouldn't go to the global right because the parent is the function of uh, outside of it like the holding function or whatever right is that is that sort of what this example is saying is that there's um there's Essentially. like the, sorry the first function environment and then the internal function environment and the internal would then um Just, post to yeah. the outer just to yeah. clarify, uh, it does not go to global, it go to the parents, which it most of the time is global. But, and okay. you see that, well, this function factor, because the parents of the, let's say the shell function yeah. uh, has its own environment. Yeah. And this is yeah. what I, and this is what's allow you like these counters to uh, be um, different counters. Uh-huh. Because like they modified the, uh, I don't know the, are we gonna call that the, the incrementing variable? Uh, they have different incrementing variable inside of themselves. Yeah. Even so, yeah, if they yeah, have yeah. the same name, because that right. the name here is binding to different environments. Right. Right. So I okay. think the thing for. For us, it's like a lot of us, when we started creating functions, we never created functions that created functions. So yeah. the super assignment, when you just create functions, always goes to parent. Right. Um, and so right. we, or it, I'm sorry, always goes to global because that's the parent. Sorry. Can, can uh, I ask one other question here? Please do. So um, this like idea of quote, creating a function now in the in the function that you wrote from that contains line 16 all the way through 24 um the the sort of the last object in that again the shell function is the function that starts on line 20. yeah so that's sort of what gets returned so that's mm -hmm. why i've created it so my question is um what happens with things like the the function return like we talked about that you know a couple of weeks ago that it's like good practice in your function to say return so that you know what it's returning and it's not just the last thing in the thing but like so you could do this okay 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 if okay. you wanted to be really explicit mm -hmm. i'm it. i'm in the camp of i like the last thing to be what's returned personally but um uh it, that's that's also really nice to be explicit and what matters is that it works for you uh-huh okay okay but it's that same idea that you're just returning something and that thing happens to be a function yeah exactly because uh, we can assign it to an object right so we can like this this function here is being assigned to uh the name f we could assign this one to a function ff right, we right. Then, oh sorry uh, we could then do our cleanup down here we could rm stuff that we had, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right, right, and we right. And could return FF at yeah. the end. Yeah. So yeah. you don't necessarily need to, um, it doesn't need to be the last thing either. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, and just because while I have the floor here, um, I'm not sure how you say your name, it's Tanashi. 
um, asked if there was a global assignment editor or a global assignment at all in the chat. Um, and I have said no he has idea. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I would check this to see. These are assignments. There might be in terms of like, I, I don't think. I'm going to, okay, I solidly, solidly don't know, but I suspect that there isn't an assignment operator for it, but yes, that one, um, that you would use a function in order to deliberately assign things to the global environment. Oh, that seems so scary. Um, but the thing is I'm writing shiny apps right now, which in which case you kind of want to get like a little bit like pushy on where uh, our, things can go. So I was actually just thinking I should start getting more familiar with some of these operators with shiny apps. No, Joe, I love your questions because we might finish this really fast. So I'm actually really happy that you're helping me eke it out. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing I did kind of want to mention with this, because I didn't have a chance to explore it, but it reminded me, I don't, I think this is related, but it, anyway. I'm going to tell you guys anyway. So a while back, I was working on a project where we were having a big workflow, which involved creating reports at the end. Um, and the workflow was cleaning up a big data set, creating a lot of like the um, figures for the reports. But we wanted to have those figures saved as ggplot objects, not just like as a ping on the, on the hard drive so that the report, which was like a markdown report, could then modify and like, you know, flex it out to fit the space it needed to fit. And it was getting nuts because these ggplot objects that I was saying is like RDS or whatever like that, they were just absolutely massive. Like they were just um, like, I, it could, I couldn't understand why this figure with like six points on it, you know, or like more than six points, but like was like, you know, almost like half a gigabyte of data, you know, uh, in terms of size. And I had like a hundred of them. So I was just trying to figure out what it was. And it has to do with ggplot contains the environment. So if you use a function to create like a ggplot plot, the environment in that function all becomes attached to that ggplot plot, which was nuts to me because I was creating, using this massive data set, manipulating it, giving it to the ggplot plot as a much smaller data set. <laughs> Um, but still that massive data set was being contained. So I actually had to use this trick of using like garbage collection and removing these objects before saving that file or actually even just returning the ggplot from the function so if that means nothing to you don't worry about it but if i just it, this kind of reminded me of that and i think it's related to this idea of kind of like when environments are attached to outputs which i hadn't really realized anyway that one was um once i figured it out it was great but before figuring it out it was really annoying I don't think you need to do garbage collection on all functions because it should be automatic. And especially because there's the clean slate, when a function runs, that environment is ephemeral. It only exists for the run and then it disappears. It's only if you're gonna run a function to create a function, then that run environment becomes attached. So usually I don't think you need to um, do that unless you're exporting ggplot objects, unless it's returning a gg some sort of object that is going to grab that environment. Let's put it that way. Unless you're returning an object from a function that's going to grab its internal environment, then you don't need to worry about it. And the two cases in which I think you do need to are if you're returning a function, or I now know if you're returning a ggplot object. But were you able to find a workaround? It's just the same as this: is you remove them, you remove them first. You remove any of the intermediate objects that you don't need. Um, you slim down the kind of that environment as much as you possibly can before you create the uh, the ggplot. Because I mean, the ggplot object has to have its data, so like that you can't get rid of. But my problem was that I had a bunch of intermediate data sets that were kind of being. I probably should have cleaned up that function and just made everything <laughs> like separate, like split it all out. But um, yeah, or you cash outside yeah 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 you basically right. set the plot in png kill r and restart yeah. <laughs> okay 
So um, this is a section where I went a little rogue and started kind of interpreting things a little bit differently um, because, uh, sorry, Tanache, are you talking about targets? Targets wouldn't help in the sense that you would have still, if you're, like, because targets works on functions, right? So it wouldn't, it would work for that workflow. Absolutely, it would work for the workflow, but it wouldn't necessarily work to keep those ggplot objects small. Oh, I was just thinking in the sense that, uh, sorry, I'm actually outside. I was thinking in the sense that um, the the target has those target factories, um, which is, you know, what we were talking about up at the top, um, where the, you know, you could write a function for ggplot and have it be flexible in the moment. Um, and it wouldn't, uh, you know, completely explode your uh, RAM uh, and your memory, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably if you write it appropriately. I don't think I was writing mine appropriately, though. Um, so I think, but th I also wasn't using targets for that project, but cool. All right. So um, some of the examples I was thinking about, I was trying to think about these examples, not just as, oh, here's an example of how it can be used, but thinking about why we would want to use it and kind of using these examples as situations in which this could be useful. Um, so for the histograms and the bin width example, I thought it was kind of useful when you want to or need to pass a function. So it's helpful to kind of create a function that, have a function that creates functions if that's what you need in the end. Um, and you don't want to have to rewrite this every single time um, because you want the function's default behavior without arguments to kind of be flexible. Um, so in our histogram and bin width um, example, we the the starting example is that you you if you have certain data sets where in this case the standard deviation ver like we're actually faceting by standard deviation, so it is very variable. Um, the bins are really you can't really compare these distributions because the bin width isn't really appropriate. So we could make a function in their example where we have bin width bins, and it creates just a function of max to min. So, and this is my interpretation of this. So in my head, I would be like, well, I would just make a function that said, let's turn these into um, uh, 20, 20, we want 20 bins. So let's just make a bin with bin function that takes the min and the max from each distribution and calculates how, many, how big those bin widths need to be if we want 20 of them. And then we could do this. So we could get the same output without actually using a function factory. And so then I was like, well, why use a function factory? And to me, I was thinking about it as like the real benefit here is if we don't want to have to change our starting function every single time we want to play with this. So one thing that's nice about using function factory is that we can create our, our little function factory and then we can use that here. And on the fly in this ggplot, we can say, oh, in this one, I want 20 bins. You could do this for like five different plots and have a different number of bins for each plot. And otherwise you have to create your own five different functions. Or you'd, if you were fid fiddling to find out what you wanted, you'd constantly be scrolling up to find the function, change it in the function, rerun the function, and then rerun your ggplot. But here, you only need to change it in one place right here. You only need to rerun this block of code. So, and then here's like the example of like, if you want to use this, kind of reuse this. So I was thinking about the function factories is that I don't think they're always um, necessary, but they can be, it's kind of like a function. A function isn't always necessary, um, but they really do help clean up your code sometimes. And I'm not really gonna talk about the box Cox example that they talked about in the book, but I felt like that was a similar kind of idea as if you didn't wanna have to just rerun things over and over. And if you didn't wanna just like be copying and pasting, this would be um, a good use. I'll have to take a look at that targets factory. I think the problem is I don't know that I've used target factories or I don't actually understand. I've done one project with targets and I don't think I understand a lot of the language yet. So um, I think I probably misunderstood the, the comments earlier. So the other thing I was thinking about uh, with another example was this idea of it being like a wrapper. And so this example was using ggsave and they wanted to wrap essentially a bunch of different other uh, graphic device functions. So you want to save 
uh, a figure, but you want to use SVG or you want to use ping, you want to use JPEG. I actually slimmed this down a lot so that we didn't have all the, the function on here. Um, and each, you know, our, each, um, each device has different arguments, so it gets a bit messy. And so in this case, you can use a function factory to kind of create it. I did look up the GG save function itself. And so this like taking out all the intermediate stuff is pretty much how it works is that they create the device function with the plot dev function factory creator, and then they use it near the end to kind of create this. So they kind of just make everything a little bit more streamlined and systematic. I think you could do this without function factories, but you'd be doing a lot of if else statements. And I'm thinking back to some of my own code and some projects, and I'm sure I could have used a function factory much more elegantly than just like giant if else. So um, it probably makes troubleshooting a little bit easier too. And it's nice. I always like code where you can see exactly what's happening right all in one place. Um, another example um, was the optimizing um, example, and this dealt with uh, maximum likelihood estimations. Do not listen to me with respect to the statistical components of this, um, but I pared it down again. I took that example and I really wanted to pare it down to why are we using a function factor in here and kind of get away a little bit from the um, I did sort of see that comment, Joe. Uh, yeah, the switch function is a base function. Uh, I think we were talking about it in conditionals um, a little bit, like there's case match, which is dplyr, case which, which is dplyr, and then there's switch, which is base. And they're all like, they're a little funny sometimes, but they're really cool. Can, can I ask a quick question about the back on the wrapper? Yeah, please um, do. So, the, re so in, the an alternative way, I guess I'm trying to figure out why they're doing the functional, the function factories here. And I guess the reason is because sometimes there is file name and sometimes file is the argument. Is that really like the only reason why you would not just it's... delete all of the function part and just go directly to the, the, the functions that you want to run? I think there are two things. Um, one is they wanted the GG save function, like that part of the function to be very kind of just about dealing with the arguments for saving a function. So the plot dev function is there to sort out all the underlying devices you need to send the information for. So then, yes, I think here, the main reason here was that there's just a lot of devices. I actually cut out most, most of them. There's like, like 10 or 15. It's kind of a nuts number how many devices they are. And some of them have files, some of them have file names, some of them have resolution, some of them have DPI, some of them have units, some of them don't. So I think there's a lot of little moving pieces going on. It's not just the file name. And so I don't think it's necessary that they use a function factory. I think they could have done it elsewise, but I think it allowed them to be streamlined in terms of here is where we are matching or mapping all the different arguments now. I'm not sure if that answered your question. You know, I, I think it, I think it did because like the way I would have done this probably at least tried was to do it without assigning functions within, you know, the SVG equals SVG light colon colon SVG light, right? Like that, that's how I would, I would have just skipped over creating the additional functions inside. Well, one more thing that I just thought of right now, actually, um, is that when I've done this in the past, I'll create a wrapper function like this that will handle all the internal logic. But what happens is that the arguments for this function need to be all the arguments from the parent function, like file name and DPI and units and everything. So you're essentially having the parent function have all these options. And then they have to all get passed on to that internal function that have to have all those options. And then those all get passed on to these functions, which then may or may not have all those options. But when you do it this way, you actually don't have to because all those arguments are dealt with when you call that function in the parent function. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, uh, there's multiple points also like, how do you handle the ellipses? Yeah, you can have multiple ellipses. I'm not sure it's possible, like the dot, dot, dot. I'm, I'm not also, sure. Yeah, that's not a dot, dot, dot. That's like, that's the stuff he got bored and didn't okay. want to write out. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. But like, yeah. I think it's an interesting discussion and maybe we can keep time at the end. And I do not have an answer uh, by any kind of mean because like you have competitive, comp 
competitive way of different, not different okay. kind of way of achieving that. One is function factory. You could have like using more oriented object system. There's like maybe different kind of way of solving this problem. And I'm, I have no, I mean, I think I need to be way more, uh, to have way more experience to tell you like, hey, this is a perfect case for function factory. Well, hey, no, you should have built like something like around R6 or whatever. I think this is like, uh, this is like a, a discussion where I do not have the answer, but like, I will say like, you probably need to practice it and see if it fits your needs a bunch of times before being able to tell you which one to pick. That's it. That's all I feel about this chapter. It's like, yeah, uh, I could have that solved another way. I don't know if my way would have been as elegant or if it would have been like more secure proof, break proof. This is all like a bunch of questions I have. And I think I, maybe you have some also, but we can maybe keep that after. I don't know. I think the dot, dot, dot passing those on too is um, that's a okay. good point. No worries. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, so yes, with the optimizing one, I was thinking of this as like a reason. I, I actually didn't know about the optimized function and I, I don't do a whole lot of stats, but I definitely had opportunity like cases in the past, especially with box clocks actually, where I could imagine wanting to optimize something. Um, I also was thinking about this example as an as a reason to do this is so that you can kind of perform these pre-computations and speed things up. Um, and also, again, this not everything needs to be done in a function or a function factory. And so this definitely works if you're trying to set something up and want to use it over and over and over again in other data sets. So this I am ignoring all the beginning of this example because there's a lot of iteration of like we could start this way, then we can do this way. And I'm kind of skipping right to the end about how we would do this. Um, so in this case, we're using a data set um, of these values. We want to use maximum likelihood estimation to find the most likely sort of value for lambda of a Poisson if this data is uh, Poisson distributed. And so we create a function um, that essentially creates the lambda um, assignment function here for a given data set. And so this is if this is particularly useful if you have um, if you want to do this for a bunch of um, data sets so that you can kind of create a data set specific function. So for example, this function factory will now take our data set and give us the LL function, the likelihood function. And now we can say, okay, what's the likelihood of having a lambda of 10? And then that we can pass on to the optimizer and we can say, okay, going from zero to a hundred, test out all these different lambdas and find us uh, the, the maximum. And that finds us that the highest log probability um, or likelihood is, uh, 30, negative 30.3. And that is at a value of lambda of about 33.1, 32.1, excuse me. And so for me, I, I was thinking like, well, you don't need to do this obviously in a function factory, but it can be really elegant, especially if you're going through a whole bunch of data sets and you want to do this and you don't want to have to like rewrite this. I think for me, the kind of take home for this chapter so far has been this is a nice way to kind of reduce the amount of code you have to write, to kind of keep it keep the important bits sort of contained in one spot and not have to kind of change everything all the time. Um, finally, we can get really kind of fancy and we can combine that previous chapter with functionals and we can actually use functionals to create factories. So this was just a fun example I thought of using per where you would map over these this list uh, of um, different powers, apply them to the power one package. We're going to get an object called funds and remember, functions are objects, so they can be in a list as well, right? So funds is now a list of functions. Um, and actually, maybe a better way of looking at that, instead of using the names, which I use names a lot to kind of pull out bits and pieces of things, um, we could run funds, we can look at the names, but then we could also use str for funds and look at the structure. And we can see that we have a list of five, square, cube, root, cube, root, and reciprocal, and these are all functions. Um, and after that, I wouldn't really look too much too closely, but that's sort of how I would uh, interpret that. Or you can look at funds and spit it all out there, and you can see we've all got these different um, functions stored in this list. You can use them by accessing that as an item in a list. 
Um, but if we wanted to avoid the prefix, there's sort of three different ways they, they talk about doing that. One is using the sort of with, this is sort of a base. Um, it, to me, I always think of it as kind of like a base way, a, a base way of having non-standard evaluation. So you can say with funds, do this. And so it's kind of like going into that object and then pulling out the, uh, treating everything in the object as if like it, they, you could just call them by name. So for example, with funds, do root 100. Um, it's temporary, it's very short term. I wouldn't use this because I think this is probably um, less uh, wordy, <laughs> less verbose, um, but it depends a little bit. I will come back to that question in a moment. Um, then the other one you can do is actually use attach. Um, attach is sort of like an old school way of sort of uh, dismantling things into your environment. Um, most people are told never use attach anymore, especially not for data sets. I also don't love it in this case, personally. Um, I find that it, they add it to the search pack, path. So I think it is kind of like loading a package and becomes like a package function. And I don't love that because I'm like, if we're creating this, it's our function. It's a user kind of, in. It, to me, there's a difference between package functions and interactively created functions. So I don't like it to be acting like a package function because it also can't be overwritten and you can attach it multiple times. And that just seems nuts. So, um, you can use rlang and mvbind, which will then bind these funds. Now, this has the downside of being like really kind of complicated <laughs> to write um, because you have to use the triple bang operator, which I know we're going to learn about, and I'm not sure what it is. I, I have a vague idea of how it works, but um, I'm not going to explain it because I have no, I don't, I definitely don't know it well enough to explain it. Um, and you can bind them, and then you can also unbind them. Um, so if you wanted to kind of release these functions into your environment, I think you can do it that way. So our, uh, yeah, I was actually, no, they don't. They all had their own separate environments here. Or, er, yes. Although we said, what was it? Or we learned this in the first. Couple slides, F and that is the environment of them. They all have separate environments. I'm pretty sure if we said funds square. And then we said funds square power, not power cube. Yeah, so their environments are different. And I think that's because every time that function, uh, every time this iterates, right, because per is, is iteration. So every time it iterates, it's calling power one a new time. And when it calls power one a new time, it gets a new environment. And that new environment is what is attached. And that is the same reason why these um, stateful functions work because this, every time you run new counter, it has a new environment because it's starting from a fresh slate um, and it attaches that new environment to the object that's being created. So otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Is that good? All right, well, that is all I actually had to talk to you guys about today. That's why I'm really glad we had questions because like I was thinking that if I don't go, those examples were so very, very long and I, Personally, didn't feel like I really wanted to talk about why we use function factories and not necessarily get into the weeds of these specific examples. Um, one place I've used them in the past, and I own, I haven't touched that code for years, so I'm kind of curious to kind of go back and look at it and see if I can improve it, was um, with API calls. And I was working on this like really scary beast of a package. Um, and we had to call the API in similar ways and iterate and do pagination. And this was before I knew of, or they existed some of the nicer packages for working with pagination and API calls. And so I needed, and also I'm not sure that the group I'm working with was pretty standard in their, in their API setup. Um, so I created function factories to create 
three different functions for each kind of set of API calls. One was sort of like the, it would create like the starting position for an API call. And the other one would create like the iterator for an API call. And the other one created like a finisher. And that way I could give them different sort of default parameters. They would check different API endpoints. They would, their starting values would come from different values in the database and things like that. But I didn't have to go and rewrite and just copy and paste the logic every single time. So I'm not certain. Now I definitely know I have never used force. So I'm also a little bit like, oh shoot, do I have to go back and check that, that I, I don't have any problems there? But um, that was one example in which I use function factories. And I use it primarily because these were big functions and I didn't want to keep repeating the code because it was the same code every time. Um, and so that's how I got around it. Yeah, attach, yeah, I don't, I, I have been definitely brainwashed into like not using ever attach and not liking attach and being very judgmental about attach. I'm, it's the same thing I feel about set working directory. I, I, I've become very snooty, <laughs> very snobby about those ones. Does anyone else have any examples of when they might've used functional factories or when they yeah, would like to? I'll, I'll link it at the beginning, the book about that, I um I don't know, remember the name. Um uh I never remember its name, but like it's a book, uh repulsive repulsible pipeline with R, something like that. And use them a lot uh as a to generate function uh to have function. <clears throat> uh, it give an example around uh, error handling, I think. Chronicler, this is what it does. And it does an example also on generating functions that generate graphic kind of similar to the one you gave, I think. Uh, but the two examples where I feel a bit uh, easier to get than the one from the advanced R book, I feel. So okay. people can also refer to it. Um, and yeah, I think like the example with the API is a good example because I think no people will rely on the R6 object or the new version to do that. So this is why like maybe the use was correct, but maybe there is another way of doing it. And this is very tricky to know when to use which method, I think. I don't know what others think about that, but. Yeah, I think, I feel like a lot in this book as a whole, I've been like, oh, that is so cool. And then I'm like, oh, do I know how to use it? <laughs> And I feel like it might be a little bit more of this idea of knowing that these things exist. And so you run into a problem that you're really like, this isn't satisfying me. You can kind of start to think about, well, wait a minute, maybe one of these things I learned about in that book and then go back and look it up. But that definitely improved my uh, comprehension of the um, environment at least. So I think this was definitely like, I don't know. I, I I feel it was way, I mean, it was more pedagogical than practical, but that's not in a bad way. Like, I'm not saying like uh, <laughs> that in the bad way. Like, um, yeah. I think I'm really attracted to the elegance of some of the solutions here. Like, I think that GG save function, although part of me is like, well, do you really need to do it that way? And I'm like, you don't, but I'm, Again, I, I think every chapter I'm always like, I think back to a project I've worked on and I'm like, I wonder if I could do it like this and it would just be like that much nicer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's a good take, like saying like, oh, it's 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 a tool that you can use sometimes and you should be aware of. Um, but, uh, and I guess people are not necessarily at, at telling you like they are using it, so you don't see it necessarily. But uh, now I'm going to be more aware, like when I look into package to see, oh, they have done it that way. And why? I think this is, so that's that's my point of view. I don't know what others think about it. Raise your hand if we are going to use fun uh, function factories now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I definitely use things where like you create a function that one of the inputs is a function. Right. Not the output of a function, but the actual function. Right. So, you know, like you can a really classic would be like a summary function. And one of the inputs is like mean, median, max, min or something like that. And then you just do the same thing. But, you know, for for different inputs. So that, to me, it's I know it's not a function factory, but it, 
I don't know. I feel like it's part of this world in terms of like working with functions as objects. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like maybe uh, I'm, I will be like, um, I need to be more um, familiar with it before I think, oh, it's going to be used with this and this and this. So it's it's like, a, it's a good first step, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But it's a first step and then maybe it's going to lead to more uh, more stuff later. Mm -hmm. Some, I mean, yeah, oh. that's, some of these chap some of the book chapters are very like, uh, I think this chapter was more like an opening, mm -hmm. you know, like it opened a bunch of possibilities uh, while other chapters are more like, oh, this is like the topic on, let's say, environment is closed with this kind of chapters. I mean, it's not closed, but like you you get enough. While this chapter was maybe more opening or use for the other way of doing it. I don't know. <laughs> Very much so. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just got really excited. You just reminded me that I used try catch for the first time, like properly yesterday, and it like worked no problem. And I was like, so excited. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations. Just, That's great. Yeah, I was and really it's, it's not a small achievement. <laughs> no, it was a really small function, though. And I'm not even sure I'm using it in an appropriate context. But um, I just wanted to... Um, I'm working on a shiny app and I just wanted to test whether or not reactive had been evaluated or not. Cause if, if you're familiar with shiny reactives yeah. are either evaluated or not, and if they're not evaluated, you get error, you get an, an error. And I just, I didn't want it to be an error. I needed to just know like true or false. Yes or no. Are we there yet? Um, so I could spit out a message anyway. And, and I just turned to try catch, you know, boom, boom, false. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, we, we should definitely experiment. Good job. I mean, it, it just, yeah, it's not it's not easy. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, everyone, uh, thanks uh, for having you today. We're gonna have me next week. I need to rush to prepare, and uh, that's it. Uh, thanks, Steffi. Oh, I, 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 I just wanted to say, like, we are half of the books. So and congratulations, everyone. We passed it half. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. And thanks, Steffi. It was great. And yeah. thanks, everyone. And I need to end. Oh, shoot. <laughs>